Hello, hello, hello. Yep. Great. Okay, we're just waiting for, I think a committee member is supposed to come in and say something. All right, hey everybody. Sorry, uh, I'm in here a couple minutes late because uh, it's in you know, classic GTW DIY fashion. We were having some trouble uh, with the camera focusing at the very last minute. Uh, my name is PJ Ray. I, uh, along with Nathan, we started this conference together in our little uh, um, our little office room in the University of Maryland six years ago now. So I'm one of the, the co-founders of the conference, and I just wanted to take a, a minute here to introduce things, uh, go over a couple like general uh, announcements, and then hand it off to the panel so they could get started. Um, so most important thing this year. Uh, Set of like name tags where we've done buttons, and these buttons are going to be, uh, you know, I hope, hopefully you know from uh, registration are your admission to the museum. So like the security folks just need to see you have these and know that you're registered. That's like your equivalent of your admin sticker. Uh, it also gives you access to the uh, the the various exhibits within the museum. Um, the security at the museum did ask us, though, that if you're going to go into any of the exhibits, that you please check your bags first. Um, you know, that's just their standard policy down here in the conference rooms. I don't think it's a big, a big deal, but they, they uh, just as a courtesy to them, make sure that uh, you do check those if you go into any of the exhibits. Um, another important thing within uh, the program, you'll find uh, our uh, harassment uh, statement or anti-harassment statement, I should say. Uh, yeah, we're, not, we're not encouraging that. Yeah, we're here, we're here to make you all miserable and feel shame. Okay, um, uh, you know, that's a really important part of, uh, of what we do here uh, as, a con as a conference and as a broader community, uh, you know, that we kind of keep a, a civil and uh, open uh, environment. And uh, we, we take the you know we take this very seriously, and um, you know just take a, a minute to familiarize yourself with it. Uh, try to treat everybody here with uh, respect. Uh, and uh, most importantly, if you do feel like somebody is violating this uh, policy or in some way you know has has uh, done something to to uh, make an uncomfortable or unsafe environment, I ask you you know please flag a committee member down, talk to us, you know, it's really important. We really want to keep a, you know, a healthy, uh, uh, productive, you know, environment here at, here at the Web, and we will take any comments uh, very seriously. Um, okay. Uh, what else do I got? I don't have my notes. See, I'm not the only one. You're not the only one who's notes. Um, okay. Uh, we did the buttons, uh, and I said you can identify any of the committee members by their buttons. Um, bathrooms, we've got a couple bathrooms. Um, they're both out in the main sort of lobby by registration. Uh, there's some bathrooms, and there's some sort of bathrooms tucked away right here around the corner uh, that probably will mostly be used by conference folks. Uh, there will be an after party tonight in the main reception area. Uh, come join us, and it'll be food, beer, and lots of uh, excitement. So uh, please do stop by and be social. Also, all the committee members will all be a little less crazy and actually have a chance to talk to people. So 
uh, you know, love to, to, to interact with everyone as a human and not as a crazy, frazzled conference organizer. Okay, um, Wi-Fi information is right here in the program. I won't uh, repeat that verbatim. But uh, just know that the bandwidth here is like really limited. We, we're pushing this venue to capacity in terms of like what it can handle technologically. And like we really ask you not to like stream uh, or download video while you're on this network because you're just going to kill it for everybody uh, and possibly kill our live streams. Okay, and uh, hashtag, so TTW16, use that with everything. Typically, we'll also use a hashtag for each panel session. Um, again, you can refer to the, uh, the uh, program for that. And final, oh, uh, I want to say one thing about time. Like we're, we really, really, really try to stick to time, not like a lot of conferences where things to, you know, tend to drag out. We, well, we're pretty tight. We want short, punchy um, presentations. We like to leave a lot of time for Q&A. And we really are like have to respect our venue, uh, the, their uh, limits, and so we do need to get all of our panels off and over on time. And so uh, we ask uh, everybody, and particularly moderators or presiders, to, to be kind of strict on time and uh, hold to those limits. And finally, I just really want to uh, thank uh, Momi for. Uh, I mean, this is really I can't imagine a, a better venue. Uh, walking in here, like, this is like my TTW dream, you know, doing this for six years, and just being like, this is the place we've been searching for. And they've been so nice and so helpful, and we've been able to do so much more in terms of, like, little details of the conference, because the venue has handled so much for them. And I would just thank Jason, since he's in here right now, who's our interface with the venue. Uh, these guys have been absolutely great, and we owe them an enormous amount of gratitude. Uh, thanks, and uh, with that, I'll hand the panel off and get out of your way. Thanks, PJ. Okay, thank you all for coming to Sightseeing. We have four exciting panelists. Um, so let me just... We have, first up, we have Chris Peterson, Imagining an Internet Worth Filtering, Mapping the Geography of Censorship in Alabama Public Schools and Libraries. Second up, we have Jonathan Karp, The Right to Rename. We have Matthew Thiessen, Big Data and the Digital Remediation of Human Nature Relations, and Shannon Sidendorf, Guns and the Myth of the Post-Geographic Web. So we'll have each of those panelists speak for 12 minutes, and I'll give you guys like five minute warning. And then we'll open it up for a Q&A. Um, so without further ado, first up, Chris. Take this thing down. Can I move this? Yeah. Want to sit? Well, how do I operate the computer? Yeah. Okay. It's a great question. Okay. So. Materiality. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Peterson. I uh, work and teach and research and do other random bullshit at MIT. Uh, and on the side, I have a research project with some friends that grew out of some work that I've done for the National Coalition Against Censorship here in New York, um, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to fighting for free speech in all of its forms. It's something that I've served in the board of directors on for the last couple of years. So um, I'm going to start, uh, as a lot of talks uh, tend to do, from biography, which is to say that I grew up in um, small towns in New Hampshire and Vermont that looked a lot like this. And when you grow up in small towns in like the late 90s in, that look a lot like this, you do two things, which is one of which is you sled. Um, and then when you're not sledding, you're hanging out on Harry Potter fan fiction Yahoo groups all of the time. Um, and uh, for me, that latter thing got a lot more complicated around the time I was transitioning from high school, from junior high to high school, because that is when uh, Congress passed the Children's Internet Protection Act, um, or rather appropriated funds to libraries and um, uh, to public libraries and public schools contingent on them implementing technical protection measures um, that were designed to protect against contact that was obscene, child pornography, harmful to minors, and they used these broad sweeping terms 
they don't really define them all that clearly. I did, I did actually go back to the bill and look and see, and you, you can notice that some of these definitions just sort of reroute you to other areas of the federal statutes. Interestingly, I did follow down the obscenity hole because I was like, what does fall under the category of obscenity according to the Constitution, not according to Supreme Court decisions? I'm sorry, according to the US Code, not according to Supreme Court decisions. And actually, uh, it's a typo. It doesn't go to 1460, which just says that this is a crime. But if you load 1461, which is next, you'll see it says mailing obscene or crime uh, inciting matter, which the first paragraph is obscene, lewd, lewd, vicious, and the next three paragraphs are all about abortion. Uh, and uh, this is just a weird little side rail, but I'll go back to this. I will say that the definitions overall in SIPA are not particularly clean. It defines a computer as any piece of hardware or software that is installed or connected to a computer and access to the internet as any device that is connected to the internet. Um, so that's what the federal um, legislation will do for you in terms of trying to define things in a clear and useful fashion. Back to Harry Potter fan fiction. Um, how I, I, I've been really interested for a long time in how the experience of being able to freely access something like this when you're in school um, becomes something like this, which is what I asked my high school civics teacher to load YouTube on a school computer, and she devoted a whole high school civics class to figuring out what was blocked and wasn't blocked yesterday, so thank you, Ms. Given. Um, and I've been working on these projects, um, similar projects, for a long time by trying to figure out what is the terrain of information access, what's available, where and when, under what conditions, and what sorts of institutions. Uh, at first, through news reports um, that were made available to the ALA and the NCAC through various things or self-reported by different librarians. Um, but more recently, over the last couple of years, with my colleagues in this Mapping Information Access project, Emily Knox, who's a professor at Illinois, Shan Oltman, a professor at Kentucky, and Sean Musgrave, the former projects editors um, for muckrock.com, a, a FOIA a facilitation site, and now an investigative journalist. So what we did, TLDR in 2014 was we sent a Freedom of Information Act request to every public school and library in the state of Alabama asking them for their collection development policies, what books they had banned or challenged for reconsidering, and what their internet filtering and access contracts and uh, configuration services were. So there are 351 such institutions in Alabama. Um, about two-thirds of them sent a response, although about 80 of those were we're not, we don't have to tell you, or we're not going to tell you, or we're too busy to tell you. Um, so we have spent the last couple of months sifting through these different responses and trying to figure out what this terrain looks like on the ground. So um, what I'm gonna show you here today are some examples in the 12 minute time constraint of uh, how these schools that are basically trying to uh, comply with this nominal standard are actually implementing it in their individual little districts and schools, right? So if you take the 40 schools that sent us a filtering configuration through some of the software that they use, the first thing that you'll notice is that there are a lot of different types of providers that they all configure with. Who even knew there were this many internet filtering companies? So let's go to the top, shall we? What is ASC, which more schools um, use than, than anything else? Um, the Alabama Supercomputer Authority is a para, yeah, I saw um, some of you just go like, huh, that's confusing. Um, this is a para-governmental -gov organization funded by the state that provides uh, internet access and hardware filtering through Alabama schools, um, which I didn't know existed until I started doing this, but it is the most popular provider of internet services and filtering and SEPA compliance in the state of Alabama. Um, however, I don't think that they actually provide the filtering because if you go to their um, information, it says the filtering software vendor includes provisions and they just sort of redirect you out to another organization that they actually never specify. What gets even weirder is that when the schools who use ASC start sending you their configuration provide, um, pro um, settings, they all look really different. So for example, just to compare, Athens City Schools went ahead and sent us back um, what their filtering configuration looks like. And you can see that they just have this long list of um, check boxes. I will draw your attention on the right to text and spoken only as a category that they have blocked from their schools for reasons I don't know. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a, a category called um, categorization failed 
which is an interesting meta category for trying to figure out websites. Um, the Athens City Schools have not yet blocked categorization failed as a type of site, but you can see that there's a whole bunch of different things on here that they've used to try to make sense of all of the different things on the internet that they might want blocked for various reasons. Compare this to Homewood City Schools, which also uses the Alabama Supercomputer Authority, um, but has a very different model of um, not only what categories they block, but what the categories in fact are. Um, so you can see that they have a very different set here. I'll draw your attention if we were to scroll down the page. They have three of my favorite categories, illegal slash questionable, criminal skills, and dubious slash unsavory. Um, three of my favorite things on the internet, all of which are blocked. Um, I'm really interested in what falls in the gap of that slash there, like what is uh, in between the demarcating categories of dubious and unsavory um, that a school might want to block. I will also say they were nice enough to send us their white lists and their black lists. Um, so you can see that on their black list, they really um, had a problem with Wordle, uh, the word cloud software, as in all of these are Wordle. <laughs> They really did not want their students ever making word clouds. Um, <laughs> however, if their students wanted to go on Mashable or Pinterest, they were fine with whitelisting these. Or maybe if the teachers wanted to go on Mashable and Pinterest, they were fine with whitelisting these. So it gets pretty chaotic pretty quickly when you're looking at some sort of compliance to what should be, in fact, a nominally standard, very clear, who could disagree with protecting the children from obscenity and harmful to minors content is. If we go down to the second most common filtering company, uh, K9, they're very interesting. If you go to the Goodwater Public Library and you try to access the internet, you will find a, that you'll have a difficult time of it because they have taken all of their web categories uh, that they suggest and just checked all of the boxes, uh, including abortion, again, that's pop gonna pop up a lot today, uh, alternative sexualities slash lifestyles, the occult, um, and lots of other things uh, that are going on in here. Now, this is not the case, you might, I mean, I will foreground my own suppositions. You know, being from New England, it's, it might be easy to look at a place like this and say, well, this is some weird backwater little town in Alabama. We started with Alabama, by the way, because it is the first state alphabetically, and we hope to do all of them. Um, but if you go just, you know, 30 minutes down the road to Horseshoe Bend Regional Library and try to pop up the internet also using the K9 filter there, you will find that they have only blocked hacking, phishing, and pornography using the same setting. So two public libraries, not that far away as towns in Alabama go, wildly different internet experiences. I don't want to run through all of these because you can imagine the story is pretty similar um, for all of these different schools and all the different settings, which is to say, very interesting, strange categories, unexpected categories, discrepancies in what is checked where and under what conditions. I do want to take a little bit of time to focus on Dan's Guardian. Now, anybody here have an idea of what Dan's Guardian is? Anybody ever heard of Dan's Guardian internet filtering? It turns out that in Alabama, there is this guy named Dan and he loves. <laughs> filtering the internet. So Dan, a few years ago, taught himself to code so that he could provide true web content filtering for all. Oh, that's blurry. That it says it filters the actual content of pages based on many methods, including all of these things. And it is impossible to just URL match your way out of uh, to SIPA compliance or whatever. He even has a nice page uh, on the left side called How I Did It. You can see it in bold. And if you go to How I Did It, it is, this is how I taught myself C++ so that I could write an internet filter for free that people can use in perpetuity should they want to filter the internet wherever they care to do it. There's also some really interesting stuff in this data about how access is contested. So. Um, how many people here have read Dana, Dana Boyd? In her dissertation, Dana has this awesome field work quote where she's talking to a teenager and saying, you know, she says, what is MySpace for? And the, my, um, the teenager in the Midwest says, well, obviously MySpace is for, and instead of saying hooking up or going to parties or concerts or one another, she says, organizing Bible studies. And it's one of these great quotes about like social networks being socially dependent and everything else. Well, the Calhoun County Public Library in Alabama had an interesting request for reconsideration where somebody from Extreme Something Ministries wrote in to request that they reconsider MySpace.com 
because can't check students somethings or upcoming church events, how can we witness the host if they can't see our profile and we can't share the gospel? And they were requesting that the library unblock my space so that they could use it for church, church events, to which the library said, no, we can't because SEPA, and it doesn't fall within the bounds of our collection development policy. So um, one other thing that I want to make really clear here is that a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people use public internet terminals in public libraries, like um, 4.3 million a year in the state of Alabama. And so this is really impacting people. And it's not necessarily only impacting them across these traditional connection, disconnected divides, or like how literate or illiterate they are at using a particular technology to use that frame. But really, this bizarre, they sometimes have access, but what computers and what institutions, for what reasons, at what times, under what library directors, or under what superintendents, for what reasons. Peter Gallison has a great um, article in Critical Inquiry called Removing Knowledge, where he talks about studying the staggeringly large effort in classification cases that's used to make knowledge unknowable. Um, and obviously, a lot of people in science, technology, and society literature have written about uh, classification and ontologies and organizing things. And so what I really find exciting about this um, data and the reason I've been continuing to do this work and wanted so much to share it with you today is because what a lot of these people on the ground are doing, not us, not people here in academia or researchers, but what the people building these software systems, building the filters, and then implementing them in their schools and libraries are not only imagining but actually theorizing a web that would be worth filtering and organizing around. Thank you. strange, but okay. Hi, my name is Jonathan. Um, I'm here from St. Louis, and I'm going to talk about Instagram. So the title of my talk is The Right to Rename, um, and I am going to speak about place names, and so in the context of Instagram, that would be geotags. Um, but first, I'm going to get my PowerPoint up here somehow. Mm. Got it. Perfect. OK. So the right to rename. And I'm going to speak about geotags in the context of placemaking and how Instagram functions as a tool uh, to make place. Um, so to do this, first, I'm going to do a little bit of a refresher for the parents on the live stream. What is Instagram? Uh, how do geot geotags work? Then I'm going to go and talk about um, what placemaking is in this context. And then I'll give a couple of examples of how this works. Um, and these examples should illustrate how uh, placemaking on Instagram is both restricted and sort of democratized by the app's loyalty to place names. Okay, so Instagram, post photos, post videos, share them with your friends. The important part for this talk is about how those photos and videos are organized. So they're organized through usernames, the person who uploads them, the people who are tagged, hashtags, so you do a hashtag in the comments, click on it, you can see all the photos and videos that are collected with that hashtag, and also geotags, and those work the same way. So you tag a place, click on that tag, you can see all the photos that are posted publicly with that geotag. All right, so what about placemaking? So I'm using this definition from an anthropologist named Keith Basso, who talks about placemaking as the process of asking and answering all these questions about place. What happened here? Who was here? Why were they there? What happens? And you know, we can see that Instagram is pretty good at answering these questions. If you click on a place, you can see a whole bunch of answers to the question, what happened at that place? Same with who was there, all those things. He also has this to say about placemaking. And this is sort of a long quote, but I'm going to read all of it and come back to it um, at the end of each example. So you don't have to remember this or anything. So he says that what is remembered about a particular place, including prominently verbal and visual accounts of what has transpired there, guides and constrains how it will be imagined by delimiting a field of workable possibilities. Placemaking is a way of constructing history itself, of inventing it, of fashioning novel versions of what happened here. Building and sharing places, in other words, is not only a means of reviving the former times, but also of revising them. A means of exploring not merely how things might have been, but also how, 
just possibly they might have been different from what others have supposed. Okay, so verbal and visual accounts of what has transpired, check. Building and sharing places, this sounds pretty similar to the functions of Instagram. So how does this work in practice? Go to the examples. The first one, uh, thanks to Snoop Dogg. So a couple of weeks ago, Snoop Dogg was on his way to Bogota, Colombia, to, do a sh to uh, give a concert, I guess, and he posted this selfie. It's a great selfie, great colors, great composition. The important part, though, is that he misspelled Bogota. He spelled, he spelled it Bogata, which is a tiny village in Romania. This is a village which is so small that it shares a Wikipedia page with, with its neighboring village. Um, and so people quickly jumped on this mistake. There was a tourism website set up. This is Visit Bogota. Snoop Dogg checked into Bogota by mistake, <laughs> but you don't have to. So this website uh, talks a lot about you know, how fast the internet speed is here. Uh, it's like really exciting, and it actually includes an Instagram feed of all the photos that have been tagged in Bogota. And if you scroll back far enough, you will see like random stuff from like schools and uh, not really exciting things. And then there are a bunch of people with cardboard cutouts of Snoop Dogg. <laughs> um, so this is this is just a pretty funny example, right? But it does show how um, a relationship with place that is founded and um, sort of. Uh, curated by Instagram can move into the real world and actually um, change people's relationship with place IRL. Um, so in terms of the definition that I gave earlier, this um, deals with how uh, placemaking guides and constrains how a place will be imagined by delimiting a field of workable possibilities. I have a feeling that before Snoop Dogg posted that photo, Snoop Dogg being in Bogota was not within the field of workable possibilities of this place, at least within the popular imagination. Now it is. OK, so the next example that I'm going to give is um, the African Burial Ground National Monument. So this is in Lower Manhattan. If you haven't been there before, you should definitely check it out. It was founded in the early 90s um, when the GSA was excavating the site to build a federal building. So they were excavating the site, they found a burial. Then they found more and more. They ended up finding the remains of over 400 people. So going back to maps, they found that in the 1600s and 1700s, this area was far enough outside of the city that um, Africans and African Americans, both free and enslaved, were allowed to bury their dead here. So this understandably ignited um, quite a bit of controversy. Uh, there was a fight over the site, over like, what's respectful to build here, what should be built here. Um, and they ended up building the federal building. It's called the Ted Weiss Federal Building. But um, they left this grassy area outside. There's a monument. And on the ground floor of the federal building, there is a little bit of a museum. And so what makes this site really powerful is that you can see these layerings, which, you know, the city, which the city, every city is built upon, this palimpsest, right? And you can see the tension between the burial ground and the federal building between the um, exploitive power of the state and the state itself. Um, so I took a photo there, and I uploaded it to Instagram. And when I got to the geotag, I was faced with this choice. Ted Weiss Federal Building, African Burial Ground National Monument. You can see it has the same address. Um, I thought I was at both. You know, They share a lobby. They share an address. They share coordinates. It's the same place. Um, but you have to choose on Instagram. I ended up choosing the African Burial Ground National Monument uh, because that's what I was there for, right? But the fact that it makes, I don't know, that, that choice um, stayed with me. It felt similar in kind to the choice that people were having to make 20 years earlier in a way when this site was founded. Um, and it felt like this choice had real consequences. In a way, it did. It organized my photo, right? So um, if I had chosen the Ted Weiss Federal Building tag, my photo would have been collected with these. You see, someone looks like somebody maybe got a job. There's this federal seal, some nice skylines. Um, I, upload it, I uploaded it on this side, though. I, don't, I guess donuts are universal, but um, <laughs> you know, there's, there are all these photos of people engaging with this site. And so, so what does this mean? Um, this means that the geotag on Instagram, uh, it collects sites, it collects photos, it also separates photos in an interesting way. It maybe sets, it separates photos that should be kept together. Um, again, what makes this site powerful is that tension. The tension is somewhat mitigated by the fact that these are organized separately. So in terms of the, def of the definition, verbal and visual accounts of what has transpired there guide and constrain how it will be imagined, right? So, um, you know, that, that uh, 
those, uh, that field of workable possibilities on the left is very different from one, uh, the one on the right. On the right, you have remembering, you have engaging with this complicated past. On the left, you have commerce. Um, okay, so last example, roads must fall. So last year, there was this huge protest movement. It's still going on at the University of, of Cape Town in South Africa called Roads Must Fall. And towards the beginning of it, students occupied this administrative building. It was called Bremner Building. They occupied it, and they renamed it the Azania House. Okay? Um, they occupied it for quite a while. They had classes. They had teach-ins. They had concerts. Um, this was the, really the center of the demonstrations for quite a while. A, student, um, a person who was there, Kumo Sambambo, uh, wrote about it in this essay, and this is a particularly interesting quote, I think. So he says that the Azania House served as a space which refused external forces of these exclusively mapped spaces. It promised a spatial safety to black identities, which are otherwise formed on precarious grounds. That spatial safety allowed for the imagination of blackness to flourish. So they occupied this space, they renamed it, they created it. Um, and how does this work on Instagram? How does this place making, this very powerful place making work? So if you search for the Azania House, this is what you get. You get an official tag with posts from students who were in the building. Um, and all of a sudden, this authenticity and importance that I jokingly described geotags lending Bogota becomes very important. Many news reports on Roads Must Fall placed the words um, renamed and Azania House in quotation marks, as if they would remain forever unverified and unverifiable, not, not real. Um, you search for it on Instagram, though, it's right there. It's as official as any other place on the app. Um, the, the Azania House might have been temporary, but here it is on Instagram, a web of users, of hashtags, of captions, of photos, all conspiring to explain to sorry all conspiring to expand the field of working of workable possibilities all conspiring to construct reconstruct history to build and share places that not only revive times but revise them um, to give people an idea for um, how things might be different from what they supposed um, you know, if you just take out those parts of this definition, it sounds a lot like the purpose of protest, of, of claiming space and naming it. Um, it gives us an idea of um, how things might have been different in the, in the past, how things might be different in the future. Um, so, <laughs> in the end, these examples show us something we probably already know really well, and that's that the relationship between a place and its representation is dynamic. Um, but as Instagram users continue to capture and share the world's moments, that's Instagram's stated goal, it's vital to ask what the app actually does with those moments. It may not want to, but it makes place, and it already constructs history by collecting this, these places, these photographs. Um, and at least for now, that history is open for revision. Thanks. All right, um, is, this, is this thing on? Yes. Um, thanks so much for coming. Uh, thanks for the TTW people for having me. I, uh, last year I was, a, I was a hash mod, which made me learn how to use Instagram, so it's always educational. <laughs> or I'm not, it's not Instagram. Whatever you do hash Twitter. mods with. Twitter, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I'm coming down uh, from, from Canada, and I'm gonna talk about, the, 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 about nature, which is maybe fitting, and uh, I'm a professor at Ryerson University in Toronto assistant professor. And uh, I'm also 40, so, um, so we're talking sort of about, uh, about the way that uh, the digital world makes place. And my paper's kind of a little bit about how, um, it's also about that, but it's also about what might be lost when place is made digital. Okay, and I'm gonna read a little bit, so just relax. 
Um, so this paper is about uh, the uh, loosely mapped natural environments and urban. Uh, this paper is about the ways loosely mapped natural environments and urban forests, what people like Deleuze and Guattari might describe as holy H O L E Y spaces that puncture the urban grid are increasingly being digitally striated and overcoated and territorialized by the very users who venture into the wilds in pursuit of urban escape, flow states, and ecologically affecting experiences. It's also about the ways pre-GPS methods of exclusion and in-group knowledge and access are being overcome and uh, sort of eradicated by mobile digital technologies, big data, and mapping software. So, I'm going to be sort of talking a little bit about mountain biking. Often when I talk about mountain biking, everyone gets angry at me because it's all like white guys jumping off bridges and stuff. But, um, but so it is. Um, so I'm going to be focusing my reflections. This is not Toronto, by the way. But it's Switzerland or something. But I'm going to be focusing my reflections, especially on the ways mountain bike, the mountain biking community in downtown Toronto, Canada, use GPS technologies like Garmin cycling computers, that kind of thing, online discussion boards, and gamification platforms, like especially a website called Strava.com, to access and explore the thickets and trails lining the city's many ravines and river valleys. And so doing, I want to objectify some of the new ways urban, ecolog e urban ecological escapism, which often we need in this digital, digitally driven world, uh, the way that this escapism is finding expression on and offline, as well as some of the new ways urban, e urban ecological escapism is being tracked, mapped, and quantified by the very individual seeking adventure in solitude under urban forest canopies, wildernesses, and beyond. So. Toronto, as you may or may not know, is the fourth largest uh, city by population in North America after Los Angeles, Mexico City, and New York. Um, in Toronto, where urban nature and the city's urban grid are entangled and complexly interdependent, the meaning of nature and how urban dwellers engage with it within city limits is little by little changing, as once much maligned rav ravine environments are reimagined as desirable urban infrastructure capable of contributing to recreational, environmental, and economic health and vitality. The specific change I want to be focusing on here is being initiated from the ground up by mountain bikers and other users of Toronto's parks, ravines, watersheds, and forests, who today are increasingly using digital GPS hardware and software to access the once more or less secret underground, clandestine, and rogue, and even illegal off-road trails that have been used by Toronto's mountain biking community for over 30 years. I want to emphasize that in the past, these trails were communally shared only by word of mouth from rider to rider in order to discourage access to wider publics and to deter the gaze of city officials who were viewed by the community as potential threats that persistently threatened to shut down, reroute, or ban illegal trail building and riding. These days, of course, digital mapping tools, big data, and publicly accessible websites like MapMyRide and Strava.com have made visible Toronto's urban off-road trail system for all to see and ride. In turn, more and more riders from across the city are operating as digitally supported urban nature explorers or voyageurs as they pierce through the dense thickets and brambles of Toronto's parks and ravines to go off the beaten track to follow lines of desire to woodland adventures on the boundaries between city and wilderness. So, uh, though Toronto's pretty flat, it's also home to a vast interconnected and interdependent network of ravines, river watersheds, and urban parkland. Indeed, Toronto's ravines, especially the Don River Valley, which I'll be focusing on here, and which is this whole thing, um, and downtown Toronto sort of here. Um, Don River Valley, which I'll be focusing on here, collectively all these uh, ravines and things add up to one of the world's largest natural urban environments and are critical life support systems and natural diversity corridors for the greater Toronto area. The Don River Valley and Watershed, a hybrid and very high traffic urban nature ecosystem where all this mountain biking happens, is home to 1.2 million Canadians, that's just in the watershed, Toronto's a little bit bigger, and is about 360 kilometers squared. Uh, Central Park is about 3.4 kilometers squared, for example. <laughs> Toronto's chief urban planner, a woman named Jennifer Kiesmitt, describes Toronto's system of ravines as upside down mountains and as nat a natural connected sanctuary that's essential to the health of the city. 
I want then to, to venture into the urban wilderness, wildernesses that exist within our built up metropolitan environments to explore the shifting landscapes of our experiences, encounters and entanglements with urban nature and the ways these instances of urban wildernesses, whether a small thicket of trees, a scruffy parquet, a vast urban wetland or a lightly managed forest are being digitally mediated and overcoded by big data, mobile uh, digital technology, GPS stuff, wearable fitness devices and other new ways of connecting and even remediating the human nature divide. I've always found it remarkable uh, that escaping the urban grind for some small semblance of nature is often as simple as finding a gap in the leaves and tunneling into a very small thicket of trees. Indeed, recent scientific and medical research shows that it doesn't take much nature to make a big impact on someone's mood, affect, levels of anxiety, feeling of, of, feelings of hope or despair, etc. Something called forest bathing, for example, is increasingly well regarded as a natural therapeutic treatment for a host of ailments from depression to cancer. Forests in the city, even little ones, offer us a getaway from the everyday. These urban thickets and unkempt or wild-like urban forests and the often hidden points of entry uh, to the networks and desire p and paths within them can be uh, Im imagined or conceptualized, I want to suggest, using Deleuze and Guattari's concept of holy space. A type of space that for them penetrates, crosses, and still communicates with smooth and striated space. They describe holy space, <clears throat> lightly managed urban forests or ravine networks, for example, in my examples. Uh, they, describe they describe these as a kind of rhizome with their gap detours, uh, subterranean passages, stems, openings, traits, holes, etc. Moreover, for Deleuze and Guattari, the existence of holy spaces, including forests, antagonizes the grid-pursuing forces of striation, the state apparatuses that seek to capture and control them, state apparatuses that impose upon them a whole regime of arborescent or tree-like or linear conjunctions. As Bont and Pratevi have suggested, despite, despite their... Um, for, uh, sp d despite, uh, yeah, forests can be imagined as sort of outside of the states or as holy spaces that are defined by a high ratio of flow to order and also as sites of creative activity. Bonta observes that holy spaces have flourished for the only way to escape the spying eyes of the state of state intelligence is to go underground. Indeed, he goes on, forests provide shelter for outlaws, misfits, the domain of guerrilla groups across the world today. Powerful in their capacity to hide, he goes on, they avoid striations and overcoating. But today, is the romantic and subversive potential of these holy spaces still possible in a world striated and overcoated by digital mapping software, ubiquitous computing, surveillance satellites, and drones, not to mention the ever uh, encroaching Fitbits and Garmin GPS technologies? <coughs> so here's a few shots of uh, the. Uh, Ravine Network, um, mountain bike trails start there and kind of go, kind of go north. Mountain bikers in Toronto have long regarded themselves as quasi outlaws or misfits. Their rogue trail building efforts in the Don in the Don Valley received, always perceived by the riding community itself to be under threat by city bureaucracies, fearing liability issues, soil erosion, and other not necessarily accurate eco-social pressures. And yet Toronto's mountain bikers have over the past 30 years hand-built a 60 kilometer and more uh, long interconnected and challenging network of pretty sustainable, flowy, rocky, and rooty single track trails that traverse and roll up and down the Don's steep ravine walls. For Toronto's mountain bikers, whether female or male, young or old, it's all about the trails and about achieving flow and fun, ideally with real live friends in 3D, along ribbons of dirt that pass between the freeways, over the tracks, and across the ravines. Historically, the riding community actively discussed the Toronto mountain bike scene, planned rides, and discussed trail status on web forums, so they were online. However, prior to GPS mapping tech and the making visible of secret trail networks online, making them, them visible online, if someone new to the city asked for directions to the trails, they would be told to meet at the grocery store parking lot, for example, to be taken on a personalized tour, or, uh, which, uh, after all, is a sort of potentially intimidating prospect uh, that demanded a certain degree of commitment and bravery because the tour guide probably is way better at it than you are. Historically, the first rule of mountain biking the Don, it seem, seems, was that you don't talk about the Don. Today, however, the once underground nature of the trails is changing thanks to digital media and, ironically, the riders who use it. The once invisible trail networks are being made visible through digital technology. The desire to be, the desire by the so-called Don rats 
for Dawn's secrecy, it seems, does not exceed their desire to data mine and upload their trajectories, favorite routes, top speeds, etc. The Dawn, then, is a contested space. It always has been, whether on or offline. Its meanings for generations of Torontonians has constantly changed, from being regarded historically as a source of sickness and pestilence because of all the mosquitoes down there, to being viewed today as a wellspring of ecological diversity. It's also an old garbage dump, etc., etc. Its meanings and affects remain as unstable as its sandy riverbanks. Moreover, its mountain bike trails, as we'll discuss, are no longer exchanged with, as I'm discussing, are no longer exchanged with secret handshakes, but are being laid bare for all to see, for better or for worse. Is this development a democratization or an extension of people's right to the city or to the trails? Or is something being lost in the woods? So these are some more shots of the features. Uh, I don't ride this thing, but it's there. <laughs> so, picture this. A lone mountain biker is flowing along the edges of the Don Valley ravine walls when she enters a blind corner only to face another rider, riding at a similar velocity coming the other way along the shared narrow ribbon of single track. They've both experienced such head-on encounters many times and know the drill, the trail et etiquette, the coded communications, and they both say solo, solo, as they pass one another, in order to indicate that there's no one behind them and you can keep going sort of full speed ahead. But sometimes when I'm riding solo through there and telling people solo, I think to myself, solo, it's not quite true anymore. Um, how ironic that we say these things, given that more and more of us cyclists are not alone and not solo as we glide through the woods. Rather, increasingly many, many of us are alone, but also sort of together, each of us riding with GPS units attached to our bikes, each of us data mining our dirt-filled derives, each of us uploading our trajectories and statistics, heart rates, speeds, power outputs, suffer scores, um, king of the mountain victories, to the same centralized digital storage sites. More often than, more often than not, a website called Strava.com, a website designed by Silicon Valley cycling enthusiasts who, due to their own busy schedules and solo road cycling rides, desired to create social media -like, like cycling platforms so that, in some sense at least, they never had to ride alone. As many of you may know, Strava is basically a big data-based uh, website where you can upload your GPS data from your ride and have that data aggregated infographically and co compared to other users and uploaders who have ridden the same sections of trail. It's also a digital platform that at once is desired insofar as des users become addicted to the data it displays and maps desire insofar as the data that gets displayed provides us with vignettes of rider traje trajectories and of their directional decisions and desires. Here's some of the trail right next to the highway. Yep, I'm almost done. Um, so here's a little statistic. This is one instance of sort of affect uh, generated enthusiasm that I experienced, where it just so happened that Doc T, that's me, Dr. Thiessen, was third in all of Toronto, third out of 498 people over a certain short stretch of quite inconsequential trail. And, I, and, and, and this was, basically it's my biggest achievement, basically. So that's me getting all like hot and bothered. So consider the following slide, yeah, which for me was one of the more thrilling digital experiences I've had of affecting and being digitally affected. So, but Strava, map, Strava maps desire in other ways, more comprehensive ways, especially when it aggregates all its data to create what's known as the Strava heat map which insofar as its color-coded, media, color-mediated map of cycling intensities captures through its evolving patterns and hues not only cyclists' desires, but also reveals or exposes the once concealed trails that because they were hidden helped generate a parallel degree of communal fellow feeling amongst those in the know, those on the inside. Now, however, in the pursuit of speed and competition, these holy spaces have been digitized, striated, overcoded, made public, made visible. Nowadays, the riders are digitally competing with one another. At the same time, of course, these trails have also been made more accessible, more available, more open to the affective experiences of others. So, if desire, so, so desire it seems goes all the way down, from mountain bikers' desire for flow in the city to their yearning to keep the trails hidden, to the desire to comp compete against virtual others and post their progress, to the desire to pour over these color-coded digital data trails in pursuit of experiences of urban ecological immersion. What's been lost and what's been gained? That is the question. Are the answers waiting for us in the data, or are they hidden in the holy spaces that remain, assuming such things still exist? Thank you.
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Shannon Sindor. So I'm just realizing that the version of this that I'm looking at is not the most recent version. Um, that is a horrifying thing to just realize. <laughs> so um, so the basic thesis of, 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 of the, my, my basic argument is that, um, you know, these, despite these early predictions that the web was going to uh, and geography, right? Because we all have, you know, are, connect, are so connected, geographic space, actually physical space will become irrelevant, and then, you know, we would all be living in this utopian uh, world where, you know, differences were obliter obliterated, and, you know, um, as we all know, that has not happened. And so, um, it, I'm basically going to use the gun debate as an example of how not only has geography not become irrelevant, in a way, it's actually become much more important. Um, sort of, but a sort of imagined geography, um, rather than uh, what I'm calling a terrestrial, or a, like a physical geography. I also love the word terrestrial, so I get to say it about a hundred times. Um, and first, I need to state my position on this topic, because when you talk about a hot-button topic like guns, people often listen only enough to see what side of the issue you're on. Uh, I'm on the side of nuance. I'm on the side of conversation. I want to have an actual public conversation on guns and gun control, and I don't see that happening or think it will under current conditions. This is a very complicated issue with so many interlocking, moving cultural cultural and historical parts, and so many groups with different stakes and sides in this debate. Digging into the issue in any way that would do it justice would take me all day, but I'm thrilled to talk about all the pieces and perspectives I'm not touching on later. Uh, and the highly polarized, emotional, shrill tone to the debate is not new. The gun debate was filled with emotion, abuse, and, and like bad argumentation long before the invention of online forums. So the web was supposed to collapse geography. Just as was heralded with the invention of the telegraph and the telephone, internet technology was going to render spatial distances irrelevant. With the web, human communication would inevitably be democratized, democratized in the shiny new realm of cyberspace. Social and geographic differences would be obliterated and we will all be able to communicate as equals. Power imbalances would be unsustainable, et cetera. Um, and you know, in the more extreme prediction, cyberspace was going to evaporate the material and the physical needs of space and place. Um, and you know, William Gibson defined cyberspace as you know, a consensual hallucination, a graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in, in the human system. So it was like the sort of physical space that we would all go to, and it, but it had nothing to do with terrestrial space. Um, and here's a quote by uh, Nicholas Negroponte, also, you know, example of this, digital living will include less and less dependence on being in a specific place at a specific time, and the transmission of place itself will start to become impossible. If I could really look out the electronic window of my living room in Boston and see the Alps, hear the cowbells, and smell the digital manure in summer, I, in a way, I'm very much in, in Switzerland. So the reason this decoupling of, of much of life from geography was so tantalizing is that pre-web, social groups and communities were mostly limited to terrestrial geography, right? The prospect of opening up a social organization regionally, nationally, globally, oh, the possibilities. People now have a freedom of association that they never would have, et cetera. Um, and all new communication technologies tend to be accompanied by these exact same predictions. You still hear, this, this utopian sort of talk, it, it's not dead. You still hear some of these, um, some of this talk about the web in talk of virtual worlds, like Second Life. You know, how these worlds will transcend the trappings of distance and spark a utopian transformative blossoming of innovation, knowledge sharing, knowledge sharing and collaboration. The truth is, as we all know, that online and territorial worlds evolve together and interrelate. Cyberspace didn't make the terrestrial world redundant, you know. 
we use geographic metaphors when we talk about the web. Website, superhighway, the web is a frontier, et cetera. We imagine the web as a territorial system. And metaphors are very important to how we conceptualize concepts and systems, and they act as a vital shortcut to understanding them. But they also tend to obscure the complex relationships between parts of the system. There are different interesting ways that geography is very much relevant still in a, so, in a network social media landscape in which it's so easy to connect with people who are physically nowhere near you. Um, there's been work done that shows on, say, Twitter, the ways people link to and share information is often centralized by geographical regions that are not really linked to where people ac actually live. Um, for example, like people will be cluster around New York fashion, you know, because their interest in New York fashion, that's a geographically sort of located place, but people, you know, nowhere near New York will be be interested in that. Um, the Flint water crisis. So the issue itself has to do with water infrastructure in one terrestrial location, but it speaks to and is symbolic of politics and race and class and disenfranchisement that are so much bigger than just, you know, that one place. Um, and also, because our social media identities are largely performative, the way a social media user, user curates your, their online presentation often incorporates terrestrial spaces, like, oh, look where I am, that signal lifestyle or identity. And that I didn't do. Um, so decades after these, you know, the prophecies, the, uh, the Negroponte and Castells, and it was, geography was be unimportant. We have not abandoned the trappings of geography, but rather allowed geography to transcend the material and become even more powerful. In discussion on the web, imagine geographical distinctions become inescapable, integrated with identities and ideologies in ways much more profound than a location field on an online profile. The debates over guns and gun control that take place in online public discussion present us with both a clear example of the salience of geography in our supposed post-geographic world and the stakes of pretending ge geography is irrelevant. The gun debate in the U.S. is a national conversation, but is al also a local one. How and if guns should be regulated is a discussion that may look different when taking place in each state or even in different communicates communities within the same state, depending on the histories of those communities and the backgrounds, beliefs, ideologies, and experience of the people who reside in them. With guns, geography and context are vitally important. For example, in an urban, non-white area, guns play a different role than in a rural white area. Um, these things are not necessarily new to the conversation about guns, but the fact that so much informal political talk happens via social media these days, some affordances of social media make some characteristics of public political conversations, especially this particular one heightened and more salient. Um, everyone wants to argue their position from a point of rationality, but the gun debate is it's a culture war issue. So we're really arguing about culture when we talk about this. Parties on both sides can use reason to support their position. People want to make the argument a factual, empirical argument. Does the ready availability of guns make us as a society and as individuals less safe or more? But culture is everything in this debate. And we'll never make headway on a solution without acknowledging the cultural meaning of guns to different people. To many, guns symbolize self-sufficiency, personal honor, safety, and for others, they symbolize crime, the use of brute force over reason, the desire to maintain an oppressive social hierarchy. Uh, so the word freedom, right? That means something very different to, to d different people on, people on different sides. The freedom of self-determination without government control or freedom from oppressive social forces, freedom from corporate control, freedom to raise children in safety. The rational empirical arguments start to fall apart when you think about this. What makes you feel free? You can live anywhere in the country and be in either of these camps. Terrestrial, and of course, I'm just talking about the gun debate in America. I should have said that before. One of the things that got screwed up when my version changed. Um, terrestrial geography is part of a part of in part a determinant of where you might fall in here. If you live in a rural area, you might be more likely to fall in the self-sufficiency camp, and if you live in an urban area, you might be more likely to fall in the safety camp, but geography becomes more relevant to this and how we imagine these two opposing ideological camps. 
Geography is, in part, largely, probably mostly, a rhetorical construct. It's framing, it's metaphor, urban versus rural, but it's much, but it's much more complex a construct, especially in this specific debate. In ideological policy debates, each side identifies victims, blames villains, commends heroes, defines the problem, and demands solutions. The way you do this, what those villains look like, who those heroes are, will be different depending on the setting you're imagining you're talking about. The heroes and villains and victims are often framed geographically in this debate, whether or not you yourself actually live there. Geography has become a feature of imagined identity. So even if you live in suburban Indiana, this decoupling of imagined geography with terrestrial geography makes it much easier to imagine oneself as the solitary gun-toting hero of the Western film ready to selflessly protect help, helpless people from evil. Social, what, how am I on time? No, I'm skipping that. Um, and one thing that's relevant here is something I call the people like me effect. It's related to the third person effect in media studies. People tend to trust those they imagine to be similar to themselves. Those are the heroes. And it's easier to imagine those dissimilar and distant as villains. And where these people or groups are terrestrially located is less important than where we imagine them to be when we think about them. We imagine our friends or people in our camp to be more like us. We're more likely to, you know, think of the people, distant others as, you know, others, and dismiss them. Um, I think I already kind of said that. So I'm drawing on Benedict Anderson's con concept of imagined community here, which I don't have time to flesh out. Um, he was specifically talking about nationalism and national identity, but internet researchers sometimes use this concept to determine, to describe how communities are formed through social media. Uh, when you have to imagine your audience and the people you're interacting with, you don't know them. Um, I am going to skip a lot of this. I just realized how kind of redundant a lot of this is. So, Housing, food, water. These are needs that can't be unlinked from geography. Guns, also, can't be separated from geography. A gun is fired in a specific place. The effects of that gun are in a specific place. So no matter how much we talk about guns in the abstract, the immediate effects of a gun take place in a specific geographic location. What could be more locally relevant than a firearm? The direct consequences of guns are very real. But in network social media, arguments on the topic become so far removed from the realities of guns themselves, the productive conversations on the place of guns in our society become all but impossible. Far from collapsing geography, in gun discussions on the web, geography has been reinvented as an obstacle to genuine public deliberation. Um, one, one way to see it is you could say that the only way to reasonably have these conversations is on the local level, where the discussion becomes as close as it can be to the physical object, not in glo global cyberspace where the discussions we engage in become so abstract and removed from this that we're not talking about this anymore. It wouldn't be such a problem if the consequences of this weren't, had, didn't have such magnitude. Okay, I don't have time to talk about this, which I'm very sad about. So, I guess I'm done. Okay, and there are people following along at home on Twitter, so I am looking if you have questions, um, just put the hashtag. But are there questions in the room first? Yes, and I have to bring the mic over, right? Yeah, it's possible. Maybe you can just come up to. That'd be great. Okay. So, first of all, I want to thank the panelists. This was absolutely a wonderful panel. Um, my question is more for Shannon. Um, the one thing that I was having trouble separating is the idea of geography. For example, a physical location within a state as opposed to a physical location like a college town or a, a more rural area. So when you're talking about geography, I was hoping that in the paper, I was hoping you talked a little bit more about more of the, as opposed to a location, more about a maybe a generalized form of geography. And also the idea of temporality 
where there's a shooting and people are reacting to that as opposed to the location of the shooting. I don't know how you would separate those two, but those were the two points that I found interesting in yours. Well, do you, okay, oh, go ahead and the mic. On that first question, are you talking more about like a region as opposed to like? No, we're talking about a definition of a town. So you would have uh, using, there are 10 different types of communities in the United States. I don't remember the book off the top of my head, but more like a college town, more like a steel town, more like a farm area. Those more generalities of geography as opposed to in, New York City or San Francisco or a more rural location. Does that make uh, does that make sense in terms of are those communities imagined across the United States as opposed to specific towns and cities? What, you mean when I'm talking about like imagined Correct. geography? Um, you, it could be a more general concept, like um, a, you know, thinking of just a rural place, yeah. or you could you could have it something a little more specific when you say like, I imagine myself as a College town kind of person. I mean, right. you know, I mean, there it it it, prob it varies. Okay. I can't remember. And then temporality. How does temporality. Like, when, it's, when there's a shooting that occurs, how does that affect geography? Are, are those oh, two well, separated? and that would depend yeah. on that. That's a that's actually that's a great great question and a great point. And that would depend on. Sadly, there are many many shootings that don't. That, that that sort of that temporality issue that's actually it's very unfortunately very brief but it would probably be it would probably matter more locally on a more local level and that's another place where sort of um, uh, uh, geography comes into play yeah. very good thank you do we have any more questions in the room yes come up here Thank you, everyone. I had a question for Chris. Um, two questions. Well, one is just a quick question. You, so far, the research has just covered Alabama. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've done a version. Sure, sure. So for those of you watching on the internet, um, the question was, uh, has this research only covered Alabama? So we did a version of this just focused on books in Massachusetts that I just hacked together while I was in grad school. With my colleagues, Shannon, and Emily, and Sean, um, we have done this in Alabama, and we're looking uh, at expanding it to other states in the US, um, which is really going to be dependent on funding. This was, in some respects, a pilot project to see, is this going to produce interesting results, and then can we justify funding? So my question then is, have you um, noticed any patterns, say, any differences between what's blocked in rural areas versus urban, or anything like that? Yeah, great question. So my um, my colleagues Emily and Shannon are working on some papers that uh, map census data to um, using map a lot here, but um, that connect census data about the Gini coefficient of a particular area or its census designated place, whether it's rural, suburb, local, all these different sorts of standards, um, to try to figure out what those things look like. But I'll tell you, um, a lot of the suppositions that I've seen or that I've I've seen people talk about, or that you would think like you know my thesis advisor when he saw that there were no books banned in Western Massachusetts by this one map. He's like, that makes me proud to be from Western Massachusetts, right? You know, Williams and Amherst and all that fun stuff. And it's probably just that, like, nobody reported anything. The data, you, you, what you quickly learn is that, you know, the data become really hard to pin down. Massachusetts state law actually has a specific provision in the open records law which says that if you challenge a book for reconsideration, the library may dispose of the record of that challenge as soon as the record is resolved, as soon as the dispute is resolved, which is like a really weird thing that I can only assume the ALA lobbied four years ago. Um, like big librarian went out and was like, we don't want any records of these things. So it's very hard to answer the question, but it's definitely something we're trying to drill to the core of. Any more questions? Right there. Hey, also about the, uh, the filtering. Um, did you study um, kind of uh, the motivations for the filtering? And one thing that's interesting to me is like, how much is it to uh, filter bad, you know, so to speak, content, and how much is it to improve the productivity of the students? 
Yeah, so this is some, so the um, this version of the project got kicked off when Emily and I met at a conference that was organized by the ALA and Google on the uh, I don't know the tenth or twelfth anniversary of SIPA actually kicking into law, and the really pivotal moment in that conference was when a school superintendent stood up and he said, "Look, none of us are actually authoritarians who like want to keep our children dumb and stupid and uninformed." Um, what actually happens as a superintendent is my job is to keep my school's name out of the papers and to make sure that my kids aren't hanging out you know, on gaming websites because they should be paying attention to math class. And yes, maybe we should try to be making math more interesting and engaging, but I can't do anything about the tenured faculty, so I'll just keep them from playing games. Um, and I don't think it's a quit. I mean, so I'm, my day job is actually I'm an admissions officer at MIT, so I visit high schools all the time. And there are a lot of times when you'll go into a high school, in particular economic areas, where you'll see no, a no gun sign on the school door, and then you'll also see no cell phones allowed at all. And then you'll go to like a really nice suburban area, and they're like, we're just like open borders, man. Just wander in and bring whatever you want, and aren't we great? And you realize that it's socioeconomically inflected. So I think, you know, my home high school in New Hampshire charges about 30, or pays about 33K a year to filter the internet, which is really expensive if you think about, like, is that really worth keeping a kid from accessing Facebook on their phone? But much cheaper if you think about, well, we'd have to pay m many different teachers to police the classroom and change things in order to get them to pay attention. So I think it's really what lens and perspective you're looking at in terms of evaluating cost effective. I have a question maybe for everyone, which is um, when we're talking about the difference between digital space and terrestrial space, over the course of um, researching your particular topics, did you come overcome any certain biases that you, or kind of assumptions that you'd had prior to that you, this research made you reconsider, just about kind of the general definitions and relation between those two types of space? Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, with the, with the uh, when, when I was doing my PhD, I would go and like, uh, sometimes just go hug a tree just to sort of feel grounded and to sort of, you know, connect and just to get away from the computer and like move my body. And, uh, and, uh, and so as, a, as someone who does this mountain biking stuff as an activity, to sort of defragment my brain to use more computer analogies, um, I really resisted the digital incursions actually. And so my, my perspective on it is pretty critical. But as I was alluding to in my presentation, um, using this stuff can be really fun actually. And so, like anything, it's sort of how you use it, not necessarily the technology itself. So, um, yeah, lots of potential in a lot of these things, I think. Um, for and 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 uh, and what I want to do, sort of going forward, is often nature itself is regarded as sort of a sort of other, particularly in urban environments, particularly maybe in communication studies, particularly um, you know human nature sort of distinctions. And I think that uh, there is some potential for digital technologies to. Um, you know, be a kind of Linus blanket or sort of a, like a sort of a, like a, you know, sort of a mediator between nature and uh, sort of uh, digital users and, and I'll give them access to, or sort of encourage them to like, you know, breach their comfort zones a little bit. I mean, I think the biggest thing that we're trying to go on in response to the man's question from earlier is basically how are these sorts of decisions about what to block and where to block and what's modeled? How do they vary across other things that tend to vary with geography? Political, social, ter you know, terrestrial geography. But I, I just don't think that we, it's a really, really, really hard question to answer and we're still trying to dig into the data to be able to do so compellingly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, there are all these articles about um, how sites like Instagram might cheapen the uh, the power of photography, and I think that I was expecting there to be some sort of a similar thing going on with place. Um, how you know the internet collapses uh, place, it collapses space between us. Um, but I think what I found, or what I have found so far, is that people engage with place on the internet, or like the um, the place on the internet that corresponds with place in real life, very similar to how they. Um, engage with, with place in real life. Um, and often, you know, some of the effects of place, like when we, um, when we see something that, um, that shocks us, that reminds us of a place's history, that is possible online as well. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe I was surprised to find so little difference. 
Um, I, you know, all of my data that I've analyzed, come al almost all of it comes from like online uh, comments forums. And I was surprised by how, like I think going into it, I thought that it would, the way it's, it, the, I guess geography would come into play in very straightforward ways. Like this person lives here and therefore they, you know, think that's not how it works. Um, People are actually very strategic about they ha how they use coded words in order to, they, they know how, the, how people come in with these rural, um, urban versus, versus rural biases, and they use certain words, I, I wish I had examples, I, I don't have them on me, but to code themselves and put themselves in per certain categories, so that's, that's where you automatically assume they are. Um, and people, so, anyway, I think that was one of the more interesting things that went against what I thought I would find. I think we are at time. So thank you so much to all four of our panelists. We'll give them another round of applause. And thank you so much for coming. One of the uh, slides there, I didn't highlight it because there was so little time, but um, one of some of the sites that are on the block here.